We all like to think we're doing good things and we're good people, but our next two speakers, Tinsley and Stephanie, um, are really good and they're really doing good things. So I'm going to let them take it away. So I'm Tinsley Gallion. This is the Global Literacy Project. Um, I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the project and then pass it off to Stephanie to go into some specifics and then give you a treat of kind of a preview of one of our recent deployments uh, in Uganda. So um, Global Literacy Project is a collaboration between the MIT Media Lab, Tufts University, Georgia State University, and the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values. I actually have appointments at both the Media Lab and the Dalai Lama Center, so I kind of span both of those organizations. Um, there's the kind of facts about global literacy are, are fairly well known, and it's not really disputed that we want to change them. But this is a kind of quick overview. Uh, there are approximately 72 million children who don't have access to schools and will never have access to schools and have no hope of becoming literate as a result of it. Um, there are nearly 800 million adults that are not literate. And this is by kind of UNESCO's measure. And their measure is rather simple. It's can they write two simple sentences about who they are and where they are. Um, a measure that we would probably all agree is not sufficient to, to, uh, to meet full literacy. Um, of those 800 million uh, illiterate adults, about two-thirds of them are women, and uh, seven, around 75% of them are concentrated in only 10 countries. So um, what we do know also from, uh, from Stephanie and Marianne's work at Tufts is that uh, Learning to read actually changes the brain, it changes the way we think, it changes our ability to engage with each other and to engage with content and material and allows us to become a contributing member of the world community. So, uh, you know, we put forward the goal of trying to build and make available, you know, publicly and openly a platform that could help uh, reach 100 million of these people in the next by the end of this decade, and then eventually grow over the next few decades to bring 170 million people into literacy. Why 170 million? Well, UNESCO have, did a study, and they proposed that if you could bring 170 million people into literacy, that the follow-on effect would be a 12% reduction in world poverty. Okay. So our, our kind of attitude was, we actually think we're at a point in time in history where we could tackle the literacy problem. Let's test that hypothesis. No harm done, right? Um, OK, so a unique moment in time. Um, there is kind of unique convergence of, um, of things that are happening right now in the world that make this possible. Uh, one is the kind of proliferation of technology, in particular mobile devices, tablet computers, and smartphones. Uh, I recently saw uh, a projection that uh, there would be a one and a half billion smartphones sold in the year 2016. That's not dollars, that's units, right? To give you a sense of the scale of that, that means one out of five people on the planet is going to buy a smartphone in the year 2016. That's a lot of smartphones. Um, you know, and what, what we're learning when we look at these populations that are disenfranchised and don't have much access is that, there are, is that even if they can't read, they're getting phones. And they have phones for a number of reasons. And it's not long before those phones will be smartphones, because um, that's the only kinds of phones they'll be. Um, the, uh, in addition, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of new work around dealing with large sets of data and data analytics, which you'll see as part of our formula and setup to be able to collect the data about how, how kids are interacting with these technologies. Uh, there's a lot of new insights about how child-driven learning and the power of it. Um, and then, as Stephanie will go into in more detail, uh, the kind of recent neuroscience has really got a deep understanding of how the brain learns to read and what aspects of the brain we need to cultivate to bring somebody into literacy. Um, okay, so the question we're asking, 
you know, is can we develop a digital learning experience for mobile devices that enables kids to learn to read on their own? So why do we think this is possible? Well, about two years ago, uh, there was an experiment done. Uh, folks from Tufts and the, the Media Lab identified two villages in Ethiopia. Uh, they were way off the grid. Uh, one of them is uh, you know, five kilometers from a water source. And the, so people spend most of their time walking to and from the water source to bring water back. Ethiopia is kind of unusual in that um, it's, you know, English is an aspirational language, and all learning is done in English after a certain age. So there was a, a large buy-in by the community and the population to have English introduced as a language. These, these populations in these villages, no one was literate in the village in their, in their local language, more or less, in English. None of them spoke any English. And so the experiment was done to go into these villages, put in solar charging stations so that tablets could be recharged. Uh, that a set of apps were curated, most of them out of the Play Store, and Stephanie and her team did that. Some, of, some we developed to supplement that at, at MIT and made part of the package. We equipped these tablets with just a big bag full of apps, and then the ability to track how those apps were being used and exactly what clicks they were doing. And a bunch of other data was coming back to us about how the kids were using them. We handed the tablets out, didn't even tell the kids how to turn them on. Okay. Within one village, within four minutes, a kid had figured out how to turn it on and excitedly ran around telling the other kids how to turn it on. Um, it, that, that particular story is that kid was actually disenfranchised from the community because of some family history. And, and what we saw is that his, his position in the society kind of immediately changed. And he's actually grown into one of the, one of the kids who's kind of leading uh, the learning experience, which was fascinating. Um, so uh, they, within about a month, they were using the tablets. We had somebody coming in once a month and swapping out the SD cards in the tablets and actually getting the data and sending it back to us. And they would also shoot short, short amount of ethnographic video of what the kids were doing with the tablets. And um, we were, within a month, the kids were pretty much using the tablets like any kid here would. So. Um, uh, they had, they'd actually managed at one point to kind of figure out how to circumvent our system that locked them out of locked a, out of the system settings and started. <laughs> um, so, oh, right. <laughs> um, so uh, Mary Ann went back after uh, after a year and did a kind of formal assessment to see where these kids were at and. Um, what we what we learned is that the kids had developed a you know a large amount of alphabetic knowledge. Uh, they knew their ABCs. They could recite them. They could recognize them. Um, they could, you know, sound symbol correspondence had come about. And the best performers had developed a, a fairly rich set of, um, of sight words, too. So um, this, this is what we saw. This is kind of an amazing testament to child driven learning. So what's our platform look like? Um, as I already mentioned, Android tablets with a population of, of apps equipped with a bunch of tracking information that tells us what the kids are doing. Um, the idea is that in Ethiopia, they're off the grid, but in more and more of our deployments, where they're actually have connected by Wi-Fi or cellular networks, so the data is actually streaming back on a daily basis to us. And so we can see right away what they're doing and what they're, how they're working. And at the same time, we can be you know, determining which apps they're engaging with, which ones are actually motive, you know, progressing their learning progress. And then we can make adjustments to those apps and then push new ones out on a daily basis over the network, too. So it's this platform that's very iterative. And um, 
has a lot of opportunity for experimentation. And as, is, as a theme that's kind of been mentioned a few times, this group allows us to fail quickly and rapidly and often until we get it right. So, <laughs> um, so where are we? Uh, Ethiopia was the first deployment. I kind of told you about that. We have deployments in rural uh, Georgia and Alabama um, in populations where parents are actually questionably literate and kids come to uh, come to the public school systems woefully underprepared. Uh, those those studies are underway, but we don't have we have early results, but nothing kind of definitive to really share yet. That's still still getting that data. And then um, there's a whole series of new deployments that were. Um, that we have lined up. Uganda just went out about a little over a month ago, and Stephanie's going to share with you some of the early video from that. That's pretty exciting. Uh, and Bangladesh, uh, a handful of sites in India and South Africa are all coming online uh, in the next couple months. So uh, we're in the process of kind of replicating this experiment and expanding it into these other areas. Um, what I've talked about to date is specifically literacy and literacy in the context of English literacy. Um, once the platform is out there, it really is agnostic of the curriculum. Uh, we've already got requests from Ethiopia to start trying to think about how we put health and hygiene information and apps on the, on the tablets. Uh, it's certainly other languages. In Bangladesh, our partner there has actually been developing apps in Bengali, and that'll be our first uh, deployment where we're coupling the English literacy apps with, with local apps and local language. Um, uh, you know, obviously, the natural science, STEM, numeracy are all candidates for there. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the values of having the Dalai Lama Center as part of the project is their particularly interested in adapting the work they've been doing to look at character development and, and ethics curriculums on the platform. Uh, part of that is realizing that, that these groups create their own positive learning environments on their own. They collaborate very much. Certain kids, particularly older girls, tend to emerge as kind of leaders and kind of play a teaching role, while uh, you know, like the young boy who, who figured out how to turn the tablet on first often figures things out and then will go tell the, his older sister about it and then she'll share it with everyone else. So there's this very collaborative, positive learning experience. So part of part of the kind of character development and ethics curriculum will be just not getting in the way of that and making sure that continues to happen. Um, we're, we're, with these multiple deployments across multiple pl platforms, we're starting to look at um, how we can cross-couple those and create connection between different cultures. You know, um, you know imagine a, um, a kid in Georgia getting, being able to interact with a kid in Ethiopia. So we can... Um, it's a, you know, it's really a platform for everyone. You know, we've talked specifically about these disenfranchised groups, but the reality is, is if we build it, anybody and everybody can use it. Uh, it's valuable for even, you know, for kids in affluent situations that are at the beginning and cusp of learning and reading. So it's really a, about being available for everybody and being open. Um, these particular types of deployments are the ones we're kind of focused on. Um, children with no schools, children with inadequate schools in South Africa. You know, we're talking about classrooms with 60, 70 kids that uh, where teachers are often underprepared to be teaching. And even if they were brilliant teachers, they could never teach that many kids effectively. So how do we help in those situations as well? And in a lot of case, cases, you know, particularly like in Georgia and Alabama, some of our deployments there are preschools. There are no preschools, and the kids come to kindergarten woefully underprepared and behind, so how do we ramp them up and get them ready for that? Um, this is kind of where we are. We consider ourselves in a phase two, which is expanding to many different sites and replicating the experiment, and at the same time wanting to start to build up the platform so that we're ready to kind of let it, let it loose and let anybody and everybody use it to grow it really fast. So that's, what the kinda, that's where we are in the process. Let me hand off to Stephanie and uh, let her dive into some of the specifics. Okay. 
So what I'm gonna talk to you uh, about for the next few minutes is uh, the specifically the literacy content that we have on this platform and that we desire to add to the platform. Um, it would not necessarily seem a natural to have the Center for Reading and Language Research at Tufts University be a part of this project because the director of that institute, Marianne Wolf, is actually fairly well known for at least warning the greater public of the potential dangers of this age in which we are transitioning from an entirely print-based culture to a much more digital-based culture. Uh, but we saw this, Marianne and I, as an opportunity for us to take what we know, what we and others in the research community have learned over the last 35 years in investigating reading both in typical, typically developing population and impaired populations, we saw this as an opportunity to inform uh, the rest of the group of what needed to happen in order for children to learn how to read. Because while we might see children discovering uh, science content or even mathematical principles if they're left on their own, we know that children do not learn how to read if they are not exposed to the content that allows them to gather the information about whatever code it is is uh, that they're learning how to read in. And in fact, what the last 35 years of research has told us is basically two different major facts. First of all, our brains were not designed to read. So unlike visual systems that come online or their own, on their own, or, or uh, uh, the sensory motor parts of our brain, you know, none of us, we talk about our children learning how to walk. But in reality, there's really nothing we do to teach our children to walk. They walk entirely on their own when they're ready to walk. Uh, and the same can be uh, 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 spoken of in regards to language. They speak when they're ready to speak. But it cannot be said of reading. Reading requires areas of the brain to, in essence, be recruited for tasks that they really were not designed to do, and then connect those areas to areas of the brain that are designed for storing the kind of information that the brain needs. So for instance, there are areas of our brain, the auditory cortex in particular, which is located kind of in between that front circle and let's say the second set of circles. So over here on the left and then the, the middle set of circles. And the auditory cortex we know before children are even born has weak but nevertheless present connections to the language areas of the brain. So in other words, that auditory cortex is already waiting for speech input. But when we learn how to read, now we're asking speech not to enter our brain through our ears. We're asking for speech to enter our brain through our eyes. So the visual cortex, way back here in the back of the brain, now has to connect to the left hemisphere of the language areas of the brain and create this circuit that you see here, connecting phonological information, orthographic or letter, letter pattern information, syntactic, semantic, and also morphological information. But the visual area of the brain does not already have connections to the language area of the brain. So what we know is regardless of whether or not children are learning how to read in Georgia or Boston or Ethiopia, every single one of those children has to build this circuit from scratch, from anew. So if we pull out this kind of uh, a gross depiction of the kinds of information that we need and look at it more, a little bit more in a detailed way, you can see that for every kind of subset area, there's a whole set of skills, and even this, uh, I would say, is, certainly does not cover everything that children need to know, but in many ways, oral language skills sets the foundation for the task of learning how to read. And if we specifically look at vocabulary knowledge, the concepts that children learn in the first years of life, how to talk about their desires, how to greet people, how to talk about the things and the people in their environment, how to describe those things and people in their environment, that's the very basis of learning how to read. And in fact, in an ideal situation in that first, second grade period, when children are learning words, how to decode those words, what we hope to see is that children are just learning the code for words that they already know. Now, in the case of kids in Alabama and Georgia who have a much more sparse vocabulary than children, let's say, in Cambridge or Newton, uh, that 
that's unfortunately not the case. So you have the dual task of enriching their oral language knowledge as well as introducing them to the beginning principles of written language knowledge. The next stage of learning how to read is to engage their knowledge of the sounds of language, so what's called phonemic awareness, not just that the sounds of your language is just kind of an inventory, but how can you manipulate them? How can you play around with those sounds? Decades of research has shown that children who are good at these skills, like rhyming and sound segmentation, are much better prepared for the next task, which is to acquire alphabetic knowledge. How do I take these sounds and apply them to the individual codes that are meant to represent those sounds? And interestingly, once children begin to learn to read in that, those very early stages, they tend to now be exposed to sets of vocabulary or sentence structure that are not present in or are not generally present in oral language. We don't in everyday language talk the way a book is written. So for instance, embedded clauses, relative clauses, the man who is standing next to the bench by the bus stop is very happy today. Those are not sentences that you see a lot or that you hear generally in spoken language, unless you're an academic. However, they are very prominent in books. So the next stage of learning how to read is also enriching uh, the oral language knowledge by exposing those children to literature. So in essence, all of these areas have individual components that need to be presented to the children, but all of those components must be interconnected in a way that feeds the entire system. It's a cyclical process. Uh, that is why one researcher, Keith Stanovich, has long talked about the Matthew effect in reading. So those children who come to school with really rich knowledge of oral language. So all of you who talk to your kids all the time, who read to your kids all the time, who schlepped into the Museum of Science, your kids are uniquely set up for this task of learning how to read, and then those kids just take off. And then they learn more oral language knowledge, and they read more complex texts, and then they learn more ideas. But children who are behind in that process, who begin the process with a more sparse vocabulary, understanding fewer sentence types, those children we see tend to be behind the moment they walk in the door, and they continue to be behind for the entirety of their school career. So so one question we have is, of course, whether or not children can learn to read on their own. And that little bit of success that we've seen already in Ethiopia uh, encourages us. But of course, Marianne and I are always the one to say, yeah, that's nifty but they're not really reading yet. Uh, and there's so much more that they need to be exposed to. And one aspect of this project that uh, has been very interesting is the chance to get out there and really investigate the whole literacy app world. And as was mentioned yesterday, uh, even within the thousands of apps that are on the Google Play Store or certainly on the iPad Store, uh, only a small set of them have anything to do with literacy whatsoever. And if you look at this representation here, those stars represent the areas that we think, even if the apps aren't designed all that well, at least they touch on these areas of the whole literacy map or of the literacy map for getting to a stage of, let's say, first or second grade reading, early second grade reading. You can see some of my stars are not full stars, they're actually half stars. That means only some of that information is represented in an app. Again, it doesn't mean the app is designed very well or is particularly engaging, but at least that information is present. What we tend to see in the literacy app world is kind of a divide between apps that are correct, meaning, when the word is represented, yes, that's actually how you would pronounce that word. So an example of incorrect content would be trying to blend together uh, the phonemes of the word C-O-W. Uh, guess what? It, we don't actually pronounce it k a w -a. Okay, so an app that tells kids that that's how you blend a word together is inaccurate. It's not giving them the right information. Uh, so you'll see accurately designed apps that are excruciatingly boring and ugly. Uh, on the other side, you do see apps that are really interesting uh, looking and are well designed but tend to misrepresent the kind of information that kids need to have. Uh, and what you'll also see up here is a lot of areas that don't 
don't have stars at all. So if we expect our students, our kids, to be able to uh, go way beyond just naming words or being able to name the letters of the alphabet, then there is a lot more work that needs to be done in this space. We know that there is no possible way that we can do that on our own, and we hope to engage you in the app development community to help us create some of that content. And then to be able to deploy that content in various areas around the world uh, and give you feedback on, on that, uh, uh, on that uh, content. Is the content accurate? Is the content well designed? Uh, are the children engaged in the content? So I, I know I'm going to go over and, uh, uh, into the question time just a little bit, but I want to move into now sharing with you some of the video of, uh, of our new deployment. Tinsley mentioned our deployment in Uganda. And I want you to see some of the behaviors uh, that the kids are displaying. So for instance, right away in day one, the task of the students was not some deep intellectual task or what we would consider to be a deep intellectual task. Their job was to just really figure out how to turn on the tablets. And sometimes, as has been repeated again and again here at this conference, you need a little failure in order to get uh, uh, to a learning stage. Uh, the next week we saw already, so within week one, that the kids, now keep in mind, we don't tell them where to go. They can explore the apps in any way they want, and within that time of the day that they have the tablets, they can play any of the apps that they want. But this is what they choose to do. They choose to write letters, and they also choose to play with apps that teach them the name of letters. So there's a big difference between n matching that symbol of the letter to the actual name of the letter, but she is on her way to be able to understand the names of those letters. What we also see right off the bat, though, is an enormous amount of collaboration. <laughs> And they're not only collaborating on literacy apps, as you might see here, but they're also collaborating in just general play. So they're not always going to use the tablets in a way that we could predict or necessarily even in the way that we design the apps to be played. They make up their own way of play. So what have we really learned? We know, first of all, that no matter where these kids have grown up, no matter what their environments are, all of these children can become computer literate. And in fact, what seemed like potentially a daunting task, we learned very, very quickly was no big deal. Within days, within hours, within minutes. The children knew how to interact with not only these, this piece of technology, but also they understood the rules within the apps, remember, with nobody telling them what to do. They discovered this on their own. We also know that in all of these different environments, whether it's in Georgia, Alabama, Uganda, Ethiopia, the children form their own 
networks. They self-organize in order to optimize learning, although of course, you know, I'm not that optimistic. A lot of this video has shown them using the tablets as weapons. <laughs> that they're four, so that does happen. But most of their time is spent in a pretty positive, supportive network. Uh, and we can also see that across different cultures and across different learning environments, that at a basic level, children are learning to write and to recognize letters. We know that's possible, which means that opens up to the window to lots of other kinds of content that if presented with the right uh, uh, apps, with the right technology, they could learn that content too. And of course, that final uh, video tells us that children are creative users, that the moment that we put something in front of them, they're going to come up with all kinds of different ways uh, to use that content, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we continuously monitor uh, what the children are doing in order to uh, better adapt what we present them with so that we can optimize their learning, optimize their enjoyment, keep them fully engaged. So I just want to end by acknowledging the team. Uh, the team is composed of Tinsley and I, and the prime principal investigators are Marianne Wolf, Cynthia Brazil here at MIT, and Robin Morris at Georgia State University. We are a strategic partnership of different labs and different expertise. However, we hope to broaden uh, this community into a real global community that is focused not just on uh, teaching children how to read, but teaching children everything that they need to be in order to optimize their involvement in the world. And if you want to know more about our project, uh, you can visit our website, our newly uh, uh, launched website. Or, and there's contact information, so if you have any questions outside of what we get to today, we'd be happy to answer any of those questions. Thank you. Okay. We, have time for, we have time for two questions. All right. Hi. You mentioned open source. Can you elaborate more on that, about your, that you guys are doing it on an open source? Right, well, the, the platform, there are a couple of different parts to the platform that we're developing. One is the, the server side stuff that's collecting the data, and then the other is the, the package that actually wraps up the apps and tracks the kids and collects the data and then ships it back to the server. And uh, all of that's gonna be open sourced. The apps that we're developing and contributing are open sourced too. Um, you know, there's, our hope would be as many apps as possible on the platform could be open source, but we're also reaching into the community of developers and uh, ha asking them to provide the apps for our use. And we know they're their commercial products, so we have to res rep you know, respect that as well. So. Hi, you mentioned that um, a rich oral language knowledge is really important to developing reading skills, um, but these apps are all in English, and mm -hmm. so obviously like that's what exists right now, but are you looking to develop apps in the native languages? Absolutely. Uh, one of uh, the strengths of this kind of collaborative is that not only can we have content that's shared across sites, so Tinsley mentioned uh, some content that we want to develop that you know kids in Georgia would be developing stories or vocabulary, the teachers, and we would share that with uh, a site in Ethiopia or Bangladesh or wherever, but we also have the ability to localize content. So for instance, our deployment in Bangladesh, that's a unique site where they have already developed some of their own content, both Bangla language and math uh, uh, apps that are in Bangla. And so those would be wrapped into the system. Um, we are at the very, very early stages of uh, a collaboration with the Oromo Studies Association. Uh, the kids in Ethiopia uh, speak the Oromo language, and, but they are neither literate in, in, in Oromo either. Um, and so we'd like to work together with them uh, in order to build also the kinds of apps that would allow the children to learn how to read in their own language. Mm -hmm. But there are no Oromo apps. I mean, I know it's pretty surprising, but right now there are no apps in Oromo. <laughs> One, one example of something we're starting to play with is that for vocabulary, we're looking at developing a very simple app that basically is a game where you match um, you know, pictures or short video loops with, with words. And that um, the idea is that that app would launch up and have a database of pictures and words that it would suck into it so it could instantiate itself with many different 
sets of vocabulary. And one of the values of doing that is that what we can do is we can go, a facilitator in Ethiopia can go around with the kids and take pictures of all the things they want to learn in their village. So then they play the app contextualized for their environment, right? And we can then have that be done in both their, their language and in English. And then the other advantage is that with multiple you know, sites, now the kids in Georgia, once they've kind of mastered that app with the content that they've created, we can say, OK, you want to see what this stuff looks like for kids in Ethiopia. And it expands their understanding. It starts to develop a kind of cross-cultural understanding and a desire and interest in other cultures. And potentially, starts to build a network that wants to communicate with each other. 